Vano asked the boss for permission to kill his brother-in-law. Big Paul approved the hit. Gravano's crew murdered Chibetta and in the sign of disrespect carved him into pieces. A hand was discovered and buried in a coffin. Sammy comforted his wife during her brother's funeral in 1981. Deborah Gravano had no idea her husband was behind Nick's murder. He is a man that went to bed with a woman every night of his married life, knowing that he murdered her brother. Not a lot of men can say that. Like other gangsters, Gravano had an ability to separate his mob world from his family life when he returned to his Staten Island home every evening. He had to work hard to bring those kids up. And it is ironic that you can paint the picture of a Fred McMurray home life, the wife, the kids, the loving family, and then you go out every day and you decide who to murder. Sammy spent weekends with his family at a 30-acre estate in rural New Jersey that he had acquired from a building contractor who owed him money. There was a horse breeding farm and a racetrack. After years of robbing, stealing, and killing, Gravano finally had a home to rival his boss's mansion. He had made it. With his success, however, came growing resentment at Paul Castellano. Like other gangsters in the crime family, Sammy felt that Castellano, who had become boss through his family connection to his predecessor, Carlo Gambino, had never paid his dues on the street. Such pretensions could be tolerated, but not Big Paul's ravenous appetite for the crime family's earnings. Castellano was already taking a big slice of Sammy's and every other gangster's earnings, but the boss was going too far. In 1984, he formed a construction company and made the head of the rival Genovese crime family, Vincent the Chin Giganti, his partner. Gravano and the rest of the Gambino soldiers were left out of most of the contracts. Big Paul even allowed Giganti to murder a Gambino captain. In Sammy's eyes, this was unforgivable a transgression against the code of the underworld. We have a code, an oath, an honor. And I think over time he found there's no real code. The oath is broken immediately from the first day by everyone. And there's no real honor. The resentment against the boss was transforming into a rebellion led by a man Sammy had met seven years earlier in a Brooklyn bar, John Gotti. In 1985, Gotti plotted to kill the crime boss. He wanted the bull with him. Gravano hesitated before giving an answer. Castellano was the father of the family. He had groomed Sammy. But John Gotti offered something Paul Castellano never would. Power within the crime family. And power meant the opportunity to make even more money. Gravano's pragmatism overcame his sense of loyalty. Every time he saw an opportunity, particularly in business, if that meant killing somebody, he killed somebody. If it meant taking over somebody's business, a bar, a restaurant, he took it over. He saw another opportunity for Sammy Gravano, and he took it. On December 16, 1985, four shooters waited for Paul Castellano to arrive at Spark Steakhouse on 2nd Avenue and 46th Street in Manhattan. Just a block away, Sammy Gravano sat next to John Gotti in a parked Lincoln. If the shooters somehow failed, the bull was ready with a 357 Magnum to finish the job. There was a bond of trust that started that night, which is, we're knee-deep in this thing, and if this thing backfires, we're both dead. Castellano and his driver, Tommy Bellotti, pulled in front of Sparks at 5 o'clock. Seconds later, gunshots erupted. Gotti and Gravano cruised past the restaurant where Bellotti and Castellano lay in pools of blood. Gotti was now head of the Gambinos. He made Gravano a captain. As the two men celebrated a new era in the Gambino crime family, Sammy had no idea how quickly it would crumble, nor that he would become the instrument of its demise. As a member of our family's administration, I helped John Gotti run the family. 
My primary responsibility was controlling the construction industry in New York. I did this by working. Sammy the Bull Gravano was a mere soldier in the Gambino crime family when he helped arrange the murder of boss Big Paul Castellano in December 1985. Just five months later, the 41-year-old would get his first taste of underworld leadership. In May 1986, the new boss, John Gotti, turned himself in to face federal racketeering charges. Gotti looked for the best man on the street to lead the Gambinos in his absence. He chose Gravano. Gotti knew he could count on the bull to keep the family in line while he called the shots from his Manhattan jail cell. One of Gotti's first steps was to order Sammy to murder a Gambino soldier named Robert D.B. DiBernardo for talking behind the boss's back. Gravano murdered DiBernardo at the Bulls Bensonhurst office on Stillwell Avenue. D.B. had overseen the Teamsters Union local that delivered materials to building job sites. It was a key to the Gambino's construction rackets, and now Sammy controlled it. Killing in Gravano's eyes was part of policing the mob to make sure that these people towed the line, said the right things, and didn't violate the rules. That's what he said. But from the greed standpoint, every time Gravano killed someone for one of these infractions, he got that much richer. Gravano did more than kill for his new boss. He got him out of jail. The bull had discovered the jury foreman could be bribed for $120,000. Sammy haggled them down to 60,000. Gotti was acquitted. Gravano had impressed Gotti so much that a year later, in 1988, he made Sammy his number three man, or conciliere. Since Gotti didn't know much about the construction rackets, he entrusted Sammy to handle them. The bull had an unnerving presence that helped him enforce the Gambino family's interests. He had these eyes that, uh, I always call them like wolf's eyes, where they could turn on you. And a big part of his role is intimidation and extortion to make all these companies play ball, and Sammy's very good at that. Among the victims of Gravano's wrath was a member of his own crew, Michael DeBat. When DeBat got hooked on cocaine, Sammy decided he could no longer be trusted. One of the Bulls crew members put six bullets in DeBat's head and neck. Gravano told DeBat's sister, Roseanne Massa, who had once been his secretary, that he had nothing to do with the murder. Sammy came to my brother's wake, he gave us $500, that that should have comforted us. And we took that $500, burnt it up in the ashtray, and told my brother to rest in peace. Sammy's ruthlessness was taking him to the pinnacle of the Gambino family. A squad of FBI agents was now paying close attention to Gravano, something the bull was tipped off about by the teenagers he played handball with near his Bensonhurst office. By now, Sammy's family had moved to this more upscale Staten Island home. Agents knew Gravano rarely strayed from his morning routine. By 7.30, he was on his way to Gleason's gym in Brooklyn. Teddy Atlas, who had once honed the skills of a Brooklyn teenager named Mike Tyson, trained his fighters there. Atlas occasionally worked out with Gravano and put him through his paces. He heard me say that a fighter, the most important thing a fighter has to do is control his fear. He, he was surprised. He said, fighters have fear? I said, everyone has fear. He said, well, I don't. And. I do remember making a conscious thought to myself, he's lying. Atlas sent his professional fighters to a hypnotist to reinforce their training. Sammy asked for an appointment. He told me he was a white collar worker. He wanted to take off weight. He actually said he wanted to stop eating cake and candy and ice cream. I would talk to him about how he was going to be the better boxer. Trainer Atlas claims Sammy tried getting an edge another way, steroids. Atlas concluded Gravano was not in the gym simply for a good workout. 
I felt that he was doing the boxing and doing the steroids to give himself confidence that he couldn't find himself, to build himself up, to bulk himself up, not physically only, but mentally, to face certain things, to be less afraid. Gravano's boss had given him reason to be anxious. John Gotti had begun holding court at the Ravenite Social Club in Little Italy, which was just a few minutes from FBI headquarters. Gotti made his top leaders check in every afternoon. John Gotti would show up there with his $2,000 suit, his $200 tie, and his entourage, and his luxury car. Sammy would show up in his work clothes or blue jeans. In the night, say 39 o'clock, Gotti would leave with his entourage to go out to party, and Sammy would leave there to go home and spend the night with his family. Gravano tried to warn his crime boss that the Ravenite was no place for the mob to conduct business. The media and even the public were showing up. Gotti didn't listen. Instead, he basked in the attention while his consigliere fumed. He knew that that light for John Gotti was like a moth to a flame, that you could circle it and bask in it for only so long before you got burned and killed. Sammy's anxieties were warranted. In November 1989, the FBI had planted a bug in an apartment above the Ravenite where John Gotti held his most private conversations. Agents were steadily building a murder and racketeering case against the Gambino family's upper echelon. In January 1990, the FBI overheard Gotti give a big promotion to the bull. Gravano became official underboss of the Gambino crime family. But with the FBI watching the family's every move, the bull could hardly enjoy his new position. He feared he was about to be indicted. He just came in the gym where we trained one day and he said, imagine that the US government's gonna be coming after me. They conquer countries, they start wars, and they're coming after little old him. That could make you shake in your boots. If he wound up in prison, Sammy worried about his teenage son, Gerard. While John Gotti had made his son a mafia captain, Sammy did not want his boy anywhere near the underworld. He had asked me, would I take care of the kid? Would I train him? I understood that that meant that he was concerned about the kid. Atlas would keep his word when Sammy's fears of going to jail became a reality. On December 11th, 1990, the FBI arrested Gravano, Gotti, and Consigliere Frank Locascio. They were locked up in the Metropolitan Correctional Center. It was there that Gravano would make the most important decision of his life, turning his back on La Cosa Nostra and testifying against his boss, John Gotti. I began to cooperate with the government in 1991. I decided to cooperate before we, meaning me, John Gotti, and our acting was there, Frank Locascio, went to trial. The moment of truth for Sammy the Bull Gravano and his crime boss, John Gotti, came on December 21st, 1990. The two mobsters were in court, along with co-defendant Frank Locascio for a bail hearing. They had been accused of murder and racketeering. Prosecutors played undercover tapes the FBI had recorded in Gotti's headquarters in Little Italy. Gravano had been passing along over a million dollars a year to his boss, but Gotti was heard complaining that the bull was getting greedy. <laughs> Gravano listened as Gotti admitted to approving several murders, including that of Robert D.B. DiBernardo, and blamed Sammy for instigating those murders. 